So my name's Woody Zoll, and I've been uh, developing software somehow or another since uh, 1982 or so. So that's about 34 or five years or so. Let's see, did anybody calculate that for me? So it's been a while, and um, I like writing software. As a matter of fact, once I started writing software for a living, I just thought I would get to just sit and write software. But what it turned out was you spend most of your time not writing software when you're working on a, at a company where you're making software. So I started thinking about other things. Can we get a little more effective so that we're spending more time doing the things that are really giving us value? So this, this is kind of a gathering of some of that thinking for me. So let's see where we can go with this. So what I want to start with is a little bit of an exercise. This might be a good thing to do with people still coming in. Um, what I'm going to share with you is a little idea, a little information about the uh, history of the uh, United States. In, um, there used to be a guy in France who owned a bunch of real estate in the United States. And he wanted to sell it. And the people in the United States wanted to buy it. So at that time, this was the United States. And this was what the guy in France owned. So the guy in France needed money because he wanted to have another war. And he, he needed the money. So he was going to sell this chunk. And the guy who runs, in our country, we call him the president. The guy who runs the country, he wanted to not only see what was in this area, but he also wanted to get some of his people all the way to here because the British kind of owned this area, or were, he was afraid that they would eventually. And so he wanted to make sure that he not only could get this chunk, but maybe get that chunk too. So what they were looking for was a, a waterway that would allow them to do, to do the transport of goods across the whole continent. So he sent a group of people out, Lewis and Clark. So Lewis and Clark uh, did an expedi a, a expedition in, in 1804, a little before I was born. So this was called the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which was also called the Corps of Discovery Expedition. So that's what they call themselves, the core of discovery. And that's why I want to talk about this topic. Is that I think that a lot of software is about discovery. So I'm going to ask a question. I want some participation. And I think the way that I'd like to do it is to have actually everybody um, kind of discuss with your neighbors. I'm going to set a timer. For about two minutes, find a group of three or four people around you, and we're going to ask ourselves a question. I'm going to set my timer first. So it's my timer. I'm just going to make it two minutes. Two minutes, that's fast enough. I want to know what would we take on such an expedition. Now I'm going to make it clear. They're starting out in St. Louis, and almost this entire area is, is unknown territory. There's no roads. There's no trains. There's no anything. It was just wilderness, more or less. There were indigenous people that lived there. Uh, there was wildlife, there was um, plant life, there was geo geology that uh, had never been seen before. Uh, they didn't quite make it into Yellowstone, I don't think they did. But you see, they're going into the wilderness. So what do we need to take on such an expedition? So I'm going to set it for two minutes, have a discussion with some of the people around you, each little grouping, come up with at least one item that you think would be important to take, and then we're going to share it with the group. So let's give that a shot. Please go ahead. Talk. Ask each other. What should you take on such an expedition? Does 
everybody got an item? So let's see what we got. So who's got an item? What should we take? What should we take? Somebody share something. And what? Clothing. Clothing. We don't want to go exploring in the nude. Good point. So the clothes you're wearing, just bring the clothes you're wearing. What else are we going to bring? A compass. Paper. For toilet paper. For drawing what you're, what you're seeing, like a journal. What else? What's that? iPhone. Nowadays, maybe so. What else? What can we bring? Shelter of some sort, like a tent. Weapons. Weapons. Who are we going to be fighting and what are we going to be doing with the weapons? I don't know. Animals. Animals. Natives. Natives. What else are we going to bring? An expert. Yeah. Knowledge. Knowledge. Courage. Courage. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. So we can bring clothing. But you know the clothing that they brought? By the time they got to here, everything that they had brought had already rotted away. Okay? That trip was just too much. How long are your shoes going to last? What's better than bringing shoes? Bringing the ability to make shoes. So it's kind of the knowledge, it's the skills. It's the, but it's not just any skills, it's the skills you need to do an expedition of discovery. So it's going to include, for example, if we brought a compass, but on the first rapids we came to in the ocean, in the, in the river, our, um, our boat capsized and we lost all those things, we still need to be able to get across and do this without that compass. So how are we going to know without the compass? We need to find out how, we need the knowledge to you know, how are we going to determine the direction we're going in without having the tools we've been depending on. So this is what discovery is about. It's bringing our wit and our abilities and our skills to it. The group of people that left, I don't remember the exact number, let's say it was 15 or 20, only one of them died on this expedition. The thing they died of was an appendicitis. Can you imagine that? These people going across unknown lands to them, doing a very hard journey that took two years, and that's the only, at least the only death of their group that they had. Pretty interesting. So what did we find? We found that we need to bring our knowledge, we need to bring our abilities, we need to have sufficient understanding of what it means to be on a discovery expedition. These have to be brave people. These are the things that we're talking about. So, what should be taken on such an expedition? To me, this is the answer. Our ability to discover, learn, and adapt. Now, they brought a bunch of stuff for trading with the indigenous people. So they're gonna, they're gonna bring some things that they can use to get things that they need along the way. And that's a good thing to have, but it's gonna be the same story. What happens if we lost those things? What if we were robbed? What if it accidentally went over a cliff? We need to bring other parts with us, other things with us. So this is about an Agile concept. As we go, we're going to learn what we need to know. They wouldn't have known the day they left what they were going to come upon, but they're going to have to learn how to deal with it when they get there. Whatever happens, is going to happen. This is sort of what this talk is about. So I'm going to tell you about another expedition. This is the uh, Vasquez expedition into Florida. You've heard of Florida, right? So they have Disney World and all that there. But in those days, there was no such thing. So this one guy had sort of had the rights to govern Mexico, 15, 1527, a little bit before that. He sort of felt that he had um, lost those rights uh, unfairly, and he got then the rights to go and govern Florida. At that time, there was not much in Florida in the way of um, civilization, but there were peoples that lived there. He started off here with his ship, three ships, and about 300 people, 400 people. And on and on they make it. Eventually, they get to Tampa Bay, near Tampa Bay. They got off the ships. They were going to march up this way and find all the gold that's in Florida. They were there for the gold. 
And they're going to come up this way because they wanted to become wealthy. And then they were going to re-meet meet with their ships up here and come on back at the end of their expedition. Well, things didn't go so well for them. So you'll see from here, this fellow, uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, was one of four survivors of those 300 people. They started out well enough. They had horses. They had guns. They had ammunition, gunpowder. They had armor. Do you, has anyone ever been to Florida? You know what Florida's like? Riding horses through Florida, through marshes, through, um, they have rains kind of like this there. Everybody's wearing metal all the time. There was, none of that was well suited to what they went to do. Their goal was to get the wealth out of Florida. So off they went. By the time they got to here, and there were no boats to pick them up, what do they have to do? Anyone want to take a guess? What are you going to do? Your boats aren't there. You have to leave. You've got to make a boat. So what, how do you make a boat when you don't have any saws or nails or hammers or materials? They reforged their armor into nails and hammers and saws. They took it. It all smelted it down and made tools out of it. And then with those tools, they cut down trees and they made four skiffs. By the time they got to here, there were only four of them still alive. Their plan was to follow along the coast in boats all the way back to Mexico. This had never been explored at that time, 1527. When they got to here, their goal was to get all the wealth out of Florida. By the time they got to here, what was their goal? Survive. By the time they got to here, what was their goal? The, from what I read about this, the, the uh, natives that were there came down and found these men on the beach and they started crying because they had never seen people so destitute. So they were in pretty miserable condition. They eventually did make it. They took a little detour up here and all the way down to here. Pretty amazing. Eight years it took them. What do you need to take on such an expedition? Same story, right? So that's what we're going to do. What was their goal? It started out, let's become wealthy. Then it became, let's just get out of here. And then it became bare survival. By the time they landed, I think in Galveston, they didn't even have clothes. They had nothing. Um, try going to Galveston today without clothes. Yeah, not going to work. OK, so this is, a, you saw this in my other talk. The object isn't to make art, it's to be in that wonderful state which makes art inevitable. So this is a quote from Robert Henry, who was an art teacher and an artist from the U.S. in, um, in the 1900s. And I really like this saying. It's about putting together an environment where we can excel at our work and excel at our lives. So software development, I'm going to make the case, hopefully, is mostly about discovery. And what do we do with that? So I'm going to share my journey first. So my journey started, I started writing software in um, 1982 or so. And uh, eventually, I was writing software for other people. And I, as I started working for other people, I started getting to see the environments that other people worked in. So I knew how I liked to work. But as I started working for other people, you have to kind of adapt to the way they work. So, I was looking for a job. I had already been introduced to um, extreme programming in the late 90s. And I was looking for a place where I could work that they were also going to do extreme programming. This was the closest thing I could find. It was a three-month contract to work on a team of 200 developers. So this was the basic thing. It was a large critical project for this company. And actually, I, I'll give away the end of the story. I think it ended up crippling this company so much that they didn't do well with this that they eventually had to sell their company. It was not a small company, thousands of people. There were over 200 developers on this one project. This is pre-Agile days, before we had the term Agile. They were going to do iterative incremental development. They were going to do six-week iterations with two weeks of design, two weeks of code, and two weeks to integrate and test, do a lessons learned, and then do the next iteration. So to me, that was at least partly uh, an extreme programming approach. So I took the contract. I was just one of 200 developers. I was just another developer on the project. So we went in for our first iteration. 
and we were all excited to get our work done. And we charged into the work, and after six weeks, we had our lessons learned meeting. So lessons learned is like a retrospective. But in the, those days, I don't think anybody was calling them retrospectives. So in the first session, I, uh, we spent several hours going over things, and I noticed there were two big areas of concern. And I was just along for the ride, I was just one of many developers, but here are the two things. The first one was, our estimates were way off. They really weren't helpful to us. Um, we made a decision, the teams there made a decision, we need to get better at estimating. The second thing I noticed that was pretty big was actually two things. And the two things are this, that the requirements weren't clear enough when we first started the iteration, and they kept changing over time. Have you ever been on a project like that? Has anybody not been on a project like that? Anybody has not been on a project like that? Okay, this is a common scenario, right? So how do we solve for that? What's that? Those days, design contract. Oh, you make a design contract. So, we, but we need to have clear requirements, and we have to have change of the uh, control of the changes, right? So, we were going to get better at understanding the requirements and controlling them. So, this is what we set out to do. So, in the next six weeks, we charged off the door. We're, oh, well, we worked hard to get better at these things. We learned some stuff, and we practiced it. We got some training, and we went off to do our work. So after the next uh, six weeks, we have our second uh, lessons learned. There were two main things that I noticed during that lessons learned that were problems. Anybody want to tell me what they were? Estimation. The estimates were off. What else? The requirements changed. The requirements kept changing. We didn't understand them very well. <laughs> so we, we did exactly the same thing, and this is what we discovered. So I don't have to bring them out a little bit at a time. And they decided we need to get better at estimating, and we need to get better at understanding the requirements and controlling the changes. I see this as a pattern, but I wasn't stupid enough to say, don't you see this is just a pattern of dysfunction? This isn't going to work for us? Because I didn't want to lose my job. So I kept my mouth shut. So we charged off to do our work. We learned some stuff, tried to get better at it. We charged off to do our work. Um, at the end of six weeks, we had our lessons learned. We spent several hours going over everything, and I noticed two big areas of concern. I don't even have to ask you now, right? You know what they were. So here's the thing. This is a pattern. As soon as I saw this, I said, there's a problem here. We are not solving for the problem. We're solving for the symptom. What's the actual problem? Now, I'm not going to ask you what that problem is right now. But that's what I was noticing. They were solving for the symptom. The symptom about the estimates and the symptom of the need to control the changes. So this is a pattern. Well, I'm going to share a little story on this, I think, before I go into it. So I decided to bring it up in that third meeting. I said, you know, guys, don't you notice this is we're solving for the symptoms? We need to figure out what the problems are. And I thought that was really clear. But after that, nobody would talk with me. Like, I would walk out through these 200 developers throughout the whole week, nobody would talk with me. I finally found a young developer, because, you know, they're, they're timid. I cornered him and was able to ask him, say, why won't you guys talk to me? Well, they're, it's easier when they're younger. <laughs> and he said, um, the managers told us not to talk with you. <laughs> and so that was a hint to me that this wasn't an unknown problem. That they knew there was something else going on here. Because as soon as I brought up that maybe there was a, something else we could work on, they don't want that really that thing to be going on. Now I'm not saying I really was on to something, but that hinted to me that I was. So I noticed this is a pattern. So this is the pattern. We're going to have whichever iteration, we're going to look at what, what we learned, we're going to try to solve for it, and it's just going to go around and around and around. If it's always the same things, let's solve for that. So I call this the cycle of continuous no improvements. Thank you. The thing is, is that we can do this forever, as long as we don't want to make things better. But we've got to figure out how to get past it. So they weren't doing this. They weren't creating an environment where it was easy to be really good at what we're doing. What they were creating was an environment where we would just keep doing the same old thing, and the same old thing wasn't working. 
Can we do this, is my question. And I think we can. And I've had some pretty good success, I think, over the years with an Agile approach. So I'm kind of a big proponent of the Agile idea. Everybody's got their own concept of what Agile is. So I'm going to share with you my idea of what Agile is. So first of all, um, Agile is a concept or a word that covers a bucket of concepts. So it's kind of a, it's just the title of a bunch of stuff that we can consider. So I like to use it this way. It's the manifesto and the values. It's like a philosophy of software development. So you all see this, right? You all know these two documents. I believe that the manifesto was created and then over the next few weeks, they put together these things. I'd have to ask somebody like, I think Mark Fowler's here. He was part of that. He probably know a lot better than me. So it's good to have a philosophy and to have some values and principles, but we need to be able to take action to put those things into use. So in software development, the actions are basically <coughs> the practices that we follow, the methods that we follow. And I kind of think of it this way. The practices that we follow is an ever-evolving set of ever-evolving practices or methods. In other words, they're always changing. The specific things we do change, and the, each one of those items itself changes. We might for a while be doing solo programming, then we decide to do pair programming. And then maybe some of us are doing mob programming. So things change over time. Each practice that we use, we use for a while to we discover a better way. And sometimes we stick with the process or, or practice and we modify it and make it better with what we learn. It's important to do that. So which practices should we use? So this is what the Agile Manifesto is about. We can use the Agile Manifesto to help guide us into understanding the practices we should be using. So I'm using the word should and so on, but I want to make it clear. I'm not meaning to tell you how to do something. I'm just telling you how I think of it. So be very cautious about that. Don't trust me if I'm telling you this is what you need to do. I'm just reflecting on this is how it works for me. So I like to call this what I'm going to share now the Agile Leftovers. The Agile Leftovers are like this. In the Agile Manifesto, it says, basically, that we value these things on the left over the things on the right. So that's why I cleverly came up with the idea of calling those the Agile Leftovers. We value the thing on the left over the thing on the right. So what do we mean by the word over? Does so anybody want to take a stab at that? What do we mean by over? Anybody? What does that mean here? Takes precedence. Takes precedence over. Uh, prioritization. Prioritization. We're going to prioritize these things over those things. Okay, that's sort of what I normally hear. Something like that. We value those things more than these, but these are still things that we can value. So I'm going to kind of give you my philosophy or my idea about this. Oops. Yeah, I want to make it clear. The manifesto says these two things. We're uncovering better ways by doing them and sharing them, helping others do it. We value the one over the other. So here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you specifically what these things are. You can read that for yourself. I put this in because I'm sort of dyslexic. I know that's the left and that's the right, but I have to remind myself it's not part of, this is not part of the manifesto, okay? So first of all, the individual's interactions over processes and tools. I'm going to share this idea. The item on the right must serve the item on the left. That's what I think this is telling us, okay? The item on the right must serve and support the item on the left. If it doesn't, we shouldn't be using it. So that's what I think the over means. These things are in support of those things. So let's look at the next one. Each item on the right can support and serve multiple things on the left. In other words, our, is our comprehensive documentation supporting our individuals and their ability to interact? Are our processes and tools supporting our ability to create working software? So it's not a one for one in the way I use it. I don't know how others use it. That's just the way I do it. Okay, the next one. The basic idea is that these items cannot detract from those items. So if we're using contract negotiation and it's making, us hard, making hard for us to have customer collaboration, 
It's a, it's a no-brainer. We don't need to think about it very much. We need to drop the things that are destroying the things on the left. And that's again, it goes across, it's not a one for one. One more thing. While the things on the right could have value, that doesn't mean we have to do them. I actually started this whole line of thinking for myself when somebody was really adamant about doing contra uh, comprehensive documentation. And they made this argument. Well, right there in the Agile Manifesto, it tells us that we value comprehensive documentation. Therefore, we are allowed to do it. So I started thinking about it. I said, I really don't get that. What I get from this is, these are the things that we've already bought into that might be interfering from the things we've discovered we want to have. So that's kind of where I started thinking about this. I have one more thing I want to add. Let's see how this works. I was looking for a way to phrase these things in a slightly different way, and this may not be ideal, but I've always had a trouble with my weight. If I eat junk food, I gain weight. It's like garbage in, garbage stays. I've been much bigger than I am right now. I work hard to maintain at least some fit and healthiness for myself. So this is the way I like to think about it. I value being fit and healthy over eating junk food. Is there any value in junk food? There absolutely is. <laughs> it makes you feel good about yourself. So. You can reward yourself. Oh, I just need a boost of energy, so I'm going to eat this candy, and so on and so on. But it might be contrary to being fit and healthy. So we need to balance these things. So this is one way that I like to think about these things. Do these things really add and help, or do these things detract? So let's be cautious about that. So this is what I call pure Agile. It's just a term I've used to say, when I talk about Agile, I mean the Agile Manifesto, and this is how I apply the Manifesto and the principles in the way that I do things. I really like the Agile Manifesto. In fact, it's just made a big difference to me in my ability to get focused on the right things on a project. Now we're moving past that. And I would say there's lots of good thinking out there that moves us beyond and if we just stay stuck in something like Agile for the rest of our careers, we're probably missing the boat. Agile is about constantly tuning, reflecting, adjusting. So this is part of the discovery process. So I'm going to check my time here. I think we're still doing okay, right? So I'm just going to have to speak a little faster or a little slower. Depending. So are you allowed to change the Agile Manifesto? Anybody want to share their thoughts on that? Yes, you can. You can't go to their website and change it there. You're not allowed to do that. But this thinking isn't there so that you just follow dogmatically something somebody's told you. It's there to spur your thinking a little bit, to give you some ideas that you can expand on, grow, change. So let's not get stuck with the idea that we're just going to do whatever's there. I like to point this one out. Somebody a long time ago she said, you know, there's a missing word in the Agile Manifesto. I said, oh, what is it? And so um, we took a look at this. Can you see the missing word? No, you can't because it's missing, right? So it's not there. So I put this one in. Feedback. All this stuff is really about feedback. Somehow or another, the principles, everything here is about getting that feedback rapidly. I wish they had put that word into the manifesto somewhere in the first place. So I can use that and say, hey, it's all about getting rapid feedback. Rapid feedback changes a lot of stuff. So I just have to make this sure with a smiley face on it. I'm not trying to upset anybody. And smiley faces are like, well, oh, I'm just kidding. Right? So let's not worry about it too much. So discovery. So I'm going to cover this just a little bit rather quickly. Again, I'm not trying to tell you how to do something. I'm sharing with you how I do something. So this is the way we think about products sometimes. We're going to make some software. When they come to us, it's all designed. Everything's in its place. You know, it's like these things all contain stuff. These jars are ready for something to put in them. Everything here is neat. It looks like it belongs there. And so we think we can take this description of our project, bring it to someone who write the software, and say, just make that thing that this describes. Think of this as a, as a project definition. But in my opinion, it's a little more like this. So this is a work of art. That was a work of art. And I think around the edges, it's a bit fuzzier, right? We don't know when we're in the middle of here, what's out over here. But as we walk in that direction, we're going to start noticing that there's just a lot more of this over there. 
So this is something we can see a few patterns in there. We can see some matching colors. Some things seem to make sense. To me, this is sort of more like what we get. We say we want to get this, we want to make this application. So a long time ago, I started noticing as soon as we started on a project, we started discovering some things. This whole talks about discovery. And it's in the doing of the work that we discover the work that we must do. We can analyze forever and still not really understand the nature of the work until we start doing it. Because doing it exposes the reality that we're living with it. So I started, uh, I say earnestly, attempting to discover the requirements of an application by starting to deliver parts of that application. So what is it that I'm looking for? I'm basically looking for something that I can recognize as being a thing, an individual chunk. The understandable is really important to me. I don't care what the size of something is. If I can't understand it, I need to get just the part of it I can understand so I can work on it. I want it to be distinct. I don't want it to be mushy any longer. I want to say, okay, I understand that, and that's a clear little bit to me. I want to make sure it's cohesive. That means it belongs together. If we're going to work on a feature or a bit of a feature, and the two parts can be separated, they don't really belong together. They might be used together later, but they don't need to be developed together. The last thing there is that I really don't care too much about what's the most important thing. I just care if it's important, and that's why potentially valuable. We don't know if it's valuable. I don't know if it's valuable until it's actually in use by somebody. That's why we want to get it into the state of being working software, where it's doing some work that it's supposed to be doing. I want to be able to decouple it, work on it, deploy it, and learn something. And so that's what this is all about. Let's use this process to discover. So we get to have these two chunks. If I can do that part and do this part, I now have a cycle that I can work with. I've done this over and over again over the last 15 years. I cannot understand a document with 200 pages in it. I can understand a document that's got one page in it. If you can't make it clear and succinct, succinct about what this one little bit is, I can't work on it. I just don't know how to do that. This is what I'm looking to do. And in the doing of the work, we start discovering what's the next thing we want to work on. So this has worked really well for me. And I call this the 80-20-80-20. And it goes like this. Let's assume that 80% of the use of the app comes from 20% of the features. I'm just making a guess that's based on the Pareto principle. If that's true, then why don't we just work on that part and not the rest of it? We don't do this because we don't know what that part is yet until we start delivering some stuff. So we can discover this. We might need to do more to discover this, but that's what I'm after. What if 80% of the use of a feature comes from 20% of the code we write. What if we can do this? Slice out that little part and then just work on it. How much percent of a project would we have to do if we discovered this? Any of you mathematicians out there? How much of a project that we envisioned do we need to write if we can do this? Somebody should know. I'm just letting it go dead here. 4%. 4%. Why are we writing 100% usually 150% or 200% of what we thought we needed? So I'm going to give a really quick example. Do we have, how much, how much time do we have left? Okay, so let's see how quick I can get through this. Um, I'm going to see if I've got a uh, booklet in here. If I don't, that's okay. Yeah, I do. So pretend that this is a requirements document. Requirements documents, how big is a requirements document, by the way? Does anybody know? I usually see them between 80 and several hundred pages. So let's pretend this is a requirements document. This group came to me, and they have these 12 calculations they would do in planning a, a production for an assembly floor in a factory. And they wanted to have an application that could do these 12 calculations for them. That they were either doing by hand or an Excel spreadsheet. I couldn't understand everything in there. So I asked them, which one of these calculations is really important to you? And they picked one out. So let's going to pretend this was an 80-page document. They already done an extensive amount of work. I picked out one to work on. I asked them to pick it out for me. And then I put it through my little thing. Can I understand this? I read it. I couldn't understand the whole thing. I said, I understand this bit, and I understand that bit. Can you connect it up better for me? We finally ended up with about that much I could understand. 
When I have that much I can understand, then I start looking for the cohesiveness. Do these things really belong together? I can write up, I can work on this part before I work on that part and deliver it. So I'm gonna work on that part. So we started in on it. And as we worked on it, we discovered another part that wasn't really cohesive, another part we didn't really understand, and we delivered that little bit. It took about a day out of that. So we got it done, we liked it. We took care of most of one of these calculations. What's the next one you want to work on? We found it. We start working on it, same thing. This is important, I understand it. That part's cohesive, it really belongs together, we don't need the rest yet. We now start working on it, we discover this little bit to deliver. Two of these, I'm gonna quickly do this, one more. I asked them, what's another important thing? They picked it up. He says, as a matter of fact, on this one, it was like one near the end. If we don't do this right, we have to start over. I said, why? Because enough time has passed that it's changed the reality that we're working in. So we found a little part, and we found a little part, and we delivered that. And I'm really serious about this. We delivered those three bits, and then I asked them, what's the next one you want to work on? And this was magical. They said, we have another project we want to work on. <laughs> This is a beautiful concept, where in the old days we would have done all this, and we would have done all this, and all we did was this. All we did was this. This is what I call deliver features until bored. <laughs> this was enough to cut the edge. It's like if you go to the doctor, you smack your hand really bad, it's hurting really bad, so we can take the pain away completely, give you morphine for the rest of the day. You won't be able to do anything, but at least your hand won't hurt. Or I can give you an ibuprofen. It cuts the pain just enough, and then you can go home. You know, that's good. This is the ibuprofen, right? This is the aspirin. We just took just enough to take the pain off, and now they're interested in some other problem. So let's crank up our ability to do this. These are small, inexpensive attempts at getting value. And once they're delivered, we learn what we want next, and pretty soon we don't care about the project that we thought we wanted. Now we want something else. That's a valuable thing. So let's crank up our attempts at this. So guess what? To me, that's what Agile does. It just basically says, let's do tons of little things, deliver them frequently, get the feedback, discover the product we want, discover when we're bored, and stop spending money when we don't think we need any more of it. So this, is, to me, is what it looks like. Where is the discovery in this process? Where are we discovering something? Anybody? Where is discovery happening? It is. Everywhere. Everywhere here. As soon as you express an idea to someone else, we've started a good process. If we turn it into a story, a story is like in software development, uh, um, I was talking to somebody at lunch, it's like we shouldn't call them stories, we should call them fairy tales. We have these fairy tales we want to work on. And so, we just expressing an idea. It turns into something we can design and code quickly, and now we've already got feedback loops. If we get all the way to actually deploying it, we get very good feedback. But somewhere in the middle of this, we may decide that's not useful to us anymore. So this is a thing. I want things to be better. I want to work in an industry where we can achieve great things in our lives, where we can actually have a fulfilled life instead of just going to work and getting through the day. So I think we need to discover excellence, and this is important to me right here. If we can put together uh, an environment to work where we, everyone can excel to the best of their abilities, they will do that. When we try to control this, we lose that possibility. There's only a little bit more I want to say about this. It's not just about our work. It's about our lives. If you come home from work and your spouse or your family says, it's so wonderful wherever that place you're working at now, because when you come home, you're full of energy, and you really are happy with your life. That's a big bonus. If your family isn't saying that to you, let's find a way to get that. So one couple little things left. Let's focus on getting good and getting good results from our retrospectives. That's just a little pet peeve of mine right now. I've been visiting a lot of companies, and I see a lot of retrospectives that aren't bringing value. So let's see if we can move past that, and let's always learn to turn up the good. So that's sort of it. I hope that that was helpful to you, and I will take some questions, if there are any.
Yes. Uh, uh, I was wondering, you mentioned the, the retrospective. One oh, here's coming with the mic. Can we lose our screen? <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, the, the retrospective where you mentioned uh, the, 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 the estimations the are of and the requirements uh, yes. of care or key change. You mentioned something that there was a problem behind it, and I'm actually curious what the original problem okay, is. Okay, so um, there's a much uh, different talk that I can give about that. So the, the issue with estimates aren't ever the estimates themselves. It's what are we putting them, what are the use for putting the estimates to? And I, um, I'm involved in a discussion on that. Uh, it's called No Estimates. But that's outside of the scope of, of this presentation. But I'd be happy to discuss it with you. If anybody wants to hear about that, we can talk about No Estimates for the rest of the conference. Just not in this talk. It's just too big. But so and the thing with the changing requirements, it's very clear to me that if we have changing requirements, we have to realize it in Agile. It's about responding to change, not about controlling change. So the problem isn't that our requirements kept changing, it was our attitude about that requirements shouldn't change. In reality, maybe they need to change. We're discovering things. And that's really, that's the crux of both of those problems. Right? Any other questions? Wow, no questions. So that's good. So we covered everything. <laughs> it's all well understood. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it.